Well, welcome along, ladies and gentlemen. We are live. We had a glitch last week. We didn't actually uh, manage to get Masterclass up and going last week, but this week we're going live, and I'm here today with Dean Sylvester. So, Dean, Dean welcome along, mate. Thanks, mate. It's probably um, partially my fault from last week. Oh, no, it, it happens. That's the uh, that's the joy of doing live streaming, mate. Anything can happen anytime, and it usually does. So, mate, what we're going to do, we're streaming out to a few different Facebook pages at the moment. Uh, it usually takes a few minutes or so for people to start coming online. So we're, uh, we're just going to have a bit of a chat, mate, about what's going on in your world for a few minutes while we let people come into the room. And, folks, if you are joining us, then please uh, send us a message. Let us know that you can hear us, first of all. So there's a chat box there on facebook if you're on youtube by all means type in a name and tell us where you're coming from so we've got some idea who our audience is we're going to talk bass today so it's going to apply to a wide range of people across a wide swath of the eastern coast of australia but uh, dean you're not fishing for bass at the moment mate you're up at barren jack having a crack at the old uh, green <laughs> green fish the murray cod yeah unfortunately um this winter, I decided I wanted to catch that meat and Murray cod, and a lot of guys have seen all my YouTube videos on targeting this thing, and um, it's basically absorbed all of my time, aside from working, for six weeks, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's terrible, terrible when you have to make that commitment. Uh, it's hard. It's um, just a crazy species. You know, I'm pretty good at – I like to pattern fish, and um, that's why I fish for bass for so long. They're a good fish to pattern and you catch big numbers of fish, so it's easy to pattern them. But when you're chasing a species that you get one to two opportunities, the guys call it a session, it makes a very hard fish to pattern. So you never really get enough, to be honest. Yeah, so there's a reason why they call them the fish of a thousand casts. And uh, I think you're, you're just explaining that right now. So, mate, we've got a whole bunch of guys coming in. So we've got Jason from New Zealand. We've got Luke from uh, Jumboomba, uh, we've got Shane Ling coming in from Tassie, we've got Matt from Tinger in New South Wales, Marcos in Sydney, Dion, Facebook is good, he says, so uh, Daniel Smith, Victoria Point, we've got Paul coming from, uh, oh, and he just says uh, he's coming across well, so all good guys, so we're going to get started in just a minute, what we're going to do, we've got a bunch of screenshots uh, of bass and various empowerments. And uh, we're going to work our way through some of those now. As usual, if you've, if you've tuned into some of these live streams in the past, you'll know that you can contact us by typing into the, uh, into the chat. So if you've got questions, we'd encourage you to post those questions. We'll try and get to all of them if we can. Uh, and we can bring them up on the screen and Dean can, can address your questions. They don't necessarily have to be uh, sonar related. We're obviously you know, interested in focusing on sonar and how to use it to target bass. But those questions can be just more general bass fishing questions. Dean's uh, fairly well credentialed as a, as a bass fish, eh? So you've, uh, you've done a ride on the tournament scene, mate, over the years. You're not doing so much of the Australian tournament stuff now, though. No, nah, I've sort of given it away a bit. I got hooked on um, going to America and, and targeting that next level of, of tournament fishing. And uh, unfortunately, with everything that we're dealing with at the moment, all the COVID-19 stuff... Um, this year didn't happen, obviously, couldn't get across there. And I don't even really know if, if next year is going to be an option now because I should be probably in the next two months planning bass fishing over there and it's sort of a bit hard with everything up in the air. Yeah, hard, hard enough here in Australia at the moment. It's hard to know whether you're going to be able to get around the country to fish. So you got to think getting shut down. Victorians at the moment. Yeah. So, good. folks, uh, for those that are just coming into the uh, into the live stream now, we're here with Dean Sylvester. Dean is actually on location at the moment at Barrenjuk, so he's in a, a cabin up there. You can see he's all rugged up. Um, it, it's not a professional studio there, but he's uh, able to... Professional like, curtains, uh, yeah. Professional curtains, yeah. Uh, it's all good. So uh, Matt's got a question, mate. We'll, we'll answer Matt's question because it's a general fishing question. And then we'll move on to, to sonar. So Matt's asking, do you like using skirted jigs on bass? Definitely not. <laughs> skirted jigs is too too slow for me. I'm more of a um, – I basically based my whole career in Oz and in the USA targeting active fish rather than um, inactive fish. And whenever there's been a jig bite – in any of the tournaments, I've always found a chatterbait bite, which is basically very similar fish, but targeting active ones that are shallow on rocks, um, around weed, those sorts of things, rather than base of trees, um, 
more stationary fish. All right, good stuff. Answers that question. Doesn't mean that you can't use skirted jigs if you uh, if you like them, Matt. It's just not Dean's okay. style. So they're, they're effective. There's no doubt about it. But uh, not, not for Dean because it means fishing a bit slower. All right, Dean, what we might do is start to go through some of those screenshots. So <laughs> Liam says, fish of a thousand casts bass, more like impoundment barra. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the, the old bass are probably uh, maybe not quite as frustrating as impoundment barra can be, but uh, there, there are times when they're yeah, obviously not as uh, active and aggressive as they could be. So I'm going to bring up the first screenshot, Dean. I'm going to spotlight it so that you and I can get out of the way. Let's just bring that up on the screen. Whoop. All right, so what have we got here? So that's just your typical side scan looking for um, looking for bass. So I use that. Um, basically, any deep impoundment, I run side scan before I find the schools to work out whether they're inactive or active. But these side scan to find fish on a big flats rather than... I mean, it takes time out of looking around. That's 140 feet you're looking at there. So you're covering mm. a big area to look for those fish. Right? Like just saving time, you know, especially tournament fishing and stuff like that. I'm very impatient and don't really have the time to be able to sand around everywhere. And if you haven't been to a lake either before or maybe haven't even been there um, just for a month, fish move, especially deep water fish that follow the bait around. So... Using a side scan like that, really easy to, to locate schools. Yeah. Now, we've got a, uh, a question here from Shane Ferris, and it's a, a location-specific one. How does Lake St. Clair fish in the winter months, Dean? Are you a Lake St. Clair expert? Yep. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say yes, I know about St. Clair. I'm not going to say I'm an expert. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Lake St. Clair in winter is probably the best time to go there. It is an incredible fishery. You can catch... Mm -hmm. I, I have in particular caught more than 100 bass in a day on soft plastics casting to the shallows. So um, if you fish there when there's not a lot of people, you go to the backs the backs of bays and the shallower, well, it's all, it's all shallow fishing, but the backs of the bays typically hold bigger fish and when you get a tournament on, they seem to just pull out of those backs of those bays and they, they get a bit harder to catch. Like leading up to a tournament, it's nothing to catch mid-40s, high-40s in the backs of those bays um, once the heap of boats start running around, those fish sort of pull back a bit. You don't seem to catch them as often. Um, but any shallow, weedy point in St. Clair in winter will have a million fish on it, thousands. I've hooked them on a two-inch plastic, had one fall off, and before you can go, oh, I've hooked another one. So, <laughs> yeah. And Shane, we recently uh, ran a podcast episode on the ALF podcast as well with uh, Maddie Langford talking about fishing for bass in Lake Sinclair. So if you want to go and find out what Maddie uses in terms of lures and tackle, that's all over at the doclures.com website. So go and check that out. So got another question coming through. This one is a sonar one. So this is, let me bring it up. So Joel Browning's asking how you find your 3D structure in deep parts of the dam. How have you found 3D structure in deep parts of the dams? So I, I don't use it anymore. Um, that was on my carbon units. I ran that 3D structure. And just without running the 3D factor of it, that transducer makes the side scan and stuff so much better. But the 3D, I found it useful, not so much for locating fish, but more being able to determine exactly where that riverbed line was and keep my boat in a position perfect to be able to follow it along rather than sort of wait uh, on your side scan for it to come up and say, oh, well, I've gone, I've cut across it now. You could just keep that on your 3D and you could keep it at a safe block at a certain distance and then maintain your depth the whole way through, which is more more what I used it for than anything else. Yeah, good. Got a question about that side scan image. I'm going to bring it back up again, Dean. So uh, can you walk us through what you're seeing there? So basically you're looking for those white specs so you can see top left of the corner just between the red dot and where it says auto c they're your bigger ones those ones that are more of a line um, and they're more bunched up so i'd sit and target them um, you have a few bigger ones on your right hand side but they're pretty much too scattered on that right hand side basically to target but the ones on the left 
top left um, being a bit bigger and tighter together. I'd, I'd target them for a little bit, and if I couldn't get a bite, I'd sound around over them with the 2D just to see what was going on there, see if they are decent fish or if they're um, sort of just like milling around, not doing much. So, so Dean, one of the questions that we get a lot and we've had in previous episodes of this series on, on different species is how do you tell the difference between active fish and fish that maybe aren't so active and, and aren't feeding? I don't, have we got a, a slide that's going to show that in the deck that we looked at earlier this evening? Yep. So 2D is what um, I use to determine active and inactive. And then yep. the difference, um, you've got one there where it's got a whole heap of flatlining fish in the bottom and then it's got the active fish above it. So that's the, that's the best way to describe that. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, so we've got a question from David. Will we discuss the future direction and innovation with Lawrence? Uh, wasn't really what we set out to do in this stream. You, is that something that you can talk to, Dean, or is it better that we just refer people back to Lawrence? Perhaps we could get a Lawrence uh, guru, some, someone from Lawrence, to come and talk about what they've got in the pipeline. Yeah, probably better off talking to someone in Lawrence. I've spent probably the last three months on the road. So I'm um, um, apart from my new live units and the ghost, I'm behind the eight ball with what's what's coming up or or on the on the cards. You, you can be sure there's plenty of innovation to come though. It's one of those things that never really stops evolving. So as soon as you get used to a new unit, they bring out another one. So I'm used yeah. to five now, so I dare say there'll be another one soon. <laughs> Excellent. Good good way to figure out when the next one's due. All right, so uh, Dion Hayes. So um, Dean, when you uh, when do you choose four hundred uh, hertz and eight hundred hertz on the side scan, and why? So I don't run four fifty five at all. Four fifty five is more the lower the frequency, the further you can go. So with four fifty five, you can look a lot further distance than you can on eight hundred. Um, four fifty five, you'd probably use deeper water offshore, more salt water type stuff for me anyway, and then the eight hundred is all my freshwater stuff. So barra, bass, everything. It's a way, the higher the frequency, the clearer the image. So um, I get a lot more detail out of 800 than I would out of 455. And I don't need the distance with bass. I just need to know. It's pointless me looking further than I can cast, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty easy. 800 is the way to go in freshwater, easy. Uh, no decision to be made there. So, Alex, uh, you should do YouTube videos. Uh, mate, we are actually doing a YouTube video as we speak. This is streaming out to multiple Facebook pages and YouTube. So go and check it out on YouTube. You'll find it there as well. Uh, got a question. I'm going to have to read this one out to you, Dean, because uh, only a, a portion of it will fit on the screen. So uh, DMAC is asking us, uh, let me just scroll back up because the, the uh, Chat's coming in faster than I can read it at the moment. So bass specific. Blue Rock Lake versus New South Wales Queensland impoundments. Does winter water temperature make a great difference? I find bass in Blue Rock on the HDS live but cannot tempt them with anything in the box. How do you target them when you fish there? Well, I found um, Blue Rock actually won the tournament down there with um, like decent sized fish but not as good as what I caught in practice. And Talking to a lot of people before I went there it was a very, everyone was talking about it's a very small fish fishery and to use small fish lures like little chubbies and smaller jerk baits and stuff like that targeting smaller fish. And uh, the one time I went there for a pre fish, I caught them all just on lipless crankbaits. Um, basically, you could, you could see them in that 10 or 12 feet and you're still casting to the bank. So the fish that you're looking at and sitting above, you're not actually targeting them. You just know that there's fish in that area and the active ones are actually going to be up shallower. When the tournament rolled around, I still had um, a chatterbait on my rod from Glenbourne and I come across a wall in the main basin that looked exactly like how I like to target bass in Glenbourne in New South Wales. And through my chatterbait there, first cast got whacked, about three casts later, caught the beast bass I'd caught there about five casts later caught the, the second biggest bass again so <laughs> that was my tournament basically fish blue rock exactly the same as I fish Glenbourne in New South Wales just with a chatterbait four inch trailer so a pretty big pretty big bait for bass fishing and um I caught tons of them so what, what really time of year is that day I think it was April so just starting to cool down a little bit which yeah. is really a good time for 
a chatterbait bite, but I think just these those fish in there seem to be really honed in on anything that vibrated and, and creature-ish, so they're all over like yabby style stuff. And um, But, yeah, as far as temperature, talking about the place, bass like colder water, believe it or not. So mm. the, colder, the colder the water, the shallower they are and the more active they are. So it's, it's basically the same Australia-wide. Once it gets hot, you can still catch them in most dams, but even in Queensland, they go deep or suspend out in deep water, and you can still have good sessions on them. But the cooler water, and especially in New South Wales and Victoria, the shallower they get and the more active they get. Excellent. Willie wants to know, when are we getting fish reveal on the side scan? <laughs> Best to leave that with the other Lorance Tech question. <laughs> all right so matt's asking the question uh, could we do a video on Lawrence live is it similar to the garmin live in terms of quality i'm seriously thinking about getting to something along those lines you talk if he's talking about the live scope um i haven't had much to play with it yet i only just put it on my boat so i'm sort of new to using it um it's not similar in terms of the I don't know about quality, but clarity, because um, Garmin obviously uses a way higher frequency, and the higher the frequency, the clearer the image. Like we're talking about before, with the four fifty five versus eight hundred. So the live scope, the live sight at the moment isn't running as high frequencies. But I have heard a little rumor of a new update to that coming out, and I don't know if it's picking up a higher frequency or not. But same as before, I've, I've been on the road so many weeks, so I'm only hearing hearsay and stuff from different people so all right so jack wants to know are halco twisties a legitimate bass lure jack go away <laughs> <laughs> i know i know a bunch of people that catch bass <laughs> go twisties but i just refuse to use them because there are so many <laughs> better metal lures available and um if you're talking about halco twisties as far as running a metal spoon for um bass yep then for sure i've caught i'd hate to imagine now thousands of bass on metal lures winding as fast as you can 40 to 60 gram metals and you just it's basically tuna fishing yep yep all right so back to a sonar question how do you know when to change your sensitivity when using side scan or do you just use auto basically mate i just run auto i um i rarely change it um with side scan down scan the best way to do it if you're not quite if you're not picking up detail that you think you need to pick up you just keep up in the you leave it on auto but do auto plus one plus two plus three just until you get um i guess what you call the bottom blowing out just being too much white then then you've gone too far but if you back it off just from there but but i basically leave it all on auto because that way when you go to each impoundment it and it sets it up right for you rather than if you take it out of auto and put it on plus five or something like that to get one particular lake depending on the water and the algae and stuff in there to be clear for you the next lake will be horrible mm -hmm. so shane's saying thank you dean for your how-to videos on laurent's sounders they've been very helpful and he'd love to see laurent's run some workshops on their sounders this is basically what we're doing isn't it workshops That's pretty much what we're doing yeah yeah so Thanks. Scott, how they where do winter whiting go in summer? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure. You might be asking the wrong guys. You've answered the bass, uh, the bass live stream. You got the answers for that one, dude? Well, I would have thought whiting in summer is the best time. That's when I've targeted my <laughs> top water, so they go super, super shallow. So basically, <laughs> summer is when we target them on top water. All right. Any tips for fishing Brogo, and how's the cod fishing in Barranjack? Well, Brogo used to be up until that last flood, um, incredible with top water. Uh, I even caught a couple off the, the boat ramp there when I just went there to have a look without taking a boat. But I've heard, um, again, it's rumors and hearsay that this, the fishing in there is pretty tough now since it went over again. And I think with that last lot of rain, it's it's gone way back up again. So not 100% sure, but I would go there. If you plan on going there, I would be going there throwing top water. There you go. There's the heads up, Dean. I'm going to switch us back to our next uh, next screenshot. So talk us through what we're looking at here, mate. So basically what I was saying before with side scan, I use it to locate fish and also just to keep an eye on the fish too. So it looks like 
there's a whole bunch of fish underneath the boat, which is true. But if you look on the side scan down the bottom, we've got hardly anything on our left anymore, yet we've got 100 feet of fish on our right. So um, it's sort of the best way to tell because I hate targeting fish once they get under the boat. Once they get under the boat, they tend to lift up and they all look like they're having a, a red-hot crack, but they're sort of not really. They're, um, they just get in amongst either the ping of your sounder or the shadow of your boat, but those fish out 100 feet to your right, they're not influenced by the boat and they will definitely eat lures. Nadine, I'm going to ask you a question. It's something that's come up in my podcast a couple of times over the uh, over the last few months, and it's um, bass guys telling us that they're actually using their sounder to draw fish away from the bottom out into deeper water where they start to bite. And, and similar thing to what you've just said, that the, the fish will actually follow the ping of the sounder, but they're not fishing directly below the boat. They're fishing for those fish a little bit further away. Is that a strategy you use as well? I actually do the opposite. I hate when oh, they bite me, so I'll go... <laughs> I can use side scan to find them on flats and if they're on a tapered flat or like a riverbed ledge, I'll actually try and position the boat shallow enough that they don't want to go in there. So I'll try and find it. Like, typically it's when there's a thermocline around and if the mm. thermocline sort of comes up, is running at about 18 feet, I'll get on the other side of that thermocline in 16 feet because they don't want to come to the boat and that way um, they'll stay put where they are. I have had the case where... I can drag them off the flats or get them to lift up, but you sort of then have to quickly get off them and cast back through them before they get back yep. to you again, which um, becomes a bit painful. And like I said, I like to target active fish. So basically, once it gets to that, I, I go. <laughs> once <laughs> I mean, one of the great things about bass fishing, of course, in, in most of our you know, quality bass empowerments is there's no shortage of fish. So. If, you, if you're not on an active school, just move around until you find an active school is, is what I tend to hear a lot. Especially, um, you sort of learn a lot during this, during tournaments, you know, like so you fish a tournament and everyone says, oh, the dam is so tough, it's so hard, blah, 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 but someone always wins and there is nearly always a story of someone catching a whole bunch. Yep, yep, absolutely. You just take yeah, the time to, the to look somewhere else. Yeah, time spent looking for fish is not wasted time. Uh, time spent sitting on a, a school that shut down and not biting can be wasted time unless you can figure oh, it out. So frustrating. Yeah. Let's go back to our screenshots, Dean. Talk us through what we're looking at here, mate. So this is very this is sort of typical of Somerset where you have a couple of different classes of fish. Um, you can see from the green and the thicker set fish that are between that ten and twelve foot mark or even sort of eight to twelve feet. Um, and you've got a whole bunch of smaller fish below them from sort of 12 down or maybe 14 down, and then you've got ones on the bottom that are just basically sulking. But um, Greeny and I won a Mega Bucks tournament with basically this exact scenario with those fish that are between 8 to 12 feet there were 2.5 kilo, 3 kilo fish, and the fish below that were 35, 38-centimetre fish. So we didn't even let... We didn't even let our lures get down to those smaller fish. We just targeted those higher, more active, and way bigger f class of fish than those ones on the bottom. So this time of year, um, winter time, you're targeting those bigger fish that are up higher in the water column and active. What lure you, you've already kind of indicated? I guess you're going to go for various metals. But basically, start with metals, and if I can't convince them on any different metal, I'll go back to a plastic. But it's um, very, very rare for me these days not to be able to find with <clears throat> Like metals is an easy thing to say. It's just like saying lures, basically. There is <laughs> 10 different types that I can run through and or maybe even 10 different types of retrieves, you know. There's so many different mm -hmm. variables with metals. It's not just – it's more like it's a whole class of its own lure now. So it's very rare in a Queensland dam that I can't catch a fish on a metal. Yeah, yeah. And I remember talking to you a while back about Somerset Dam and you were working your way through various different spoons at that stage, the Palms spoons, and you know, basically using the same variations of the same lure in different ways. It was a, a very interesting episode, yeah. Got another question coming through from Matt. So he's saying, how can I stop the electric motor interfering with my front sounder? And is it worth linking my motor guide XI5 to the Lowrance HDS7? Well... The easiest way is to buy Lorance Ghost because there's no interference and the transducer is built in the head. <laughs> and I haven't linked um, 
I've never seen anyone link the motor guide to their to their sounder, so I don't really know the advantages of it. I know running the Ghost, there's big advantages for me because I have autopilot um, through your sounder, so I can easily click on it and let it let it drive me to a spot or let it track along a bank or set a course for electric dam or whatever. Um, interference, I'm not sure about motor guides. I know um, you can run a rubber ring underneath your hose clamp on the on the motor itself where your transducer is and then the best part is to keep that cable well and truly away from any power cables from the from that motor because the majority of your interference is it's it's magnetic interference from the current affecting your transducer yeah it's all about isolation and insulation isolation first and then insulation basically all right oversimplifying it there but let's uh let's go over to our next uh <laughs> our next screenshot mate so basically this one very similar to the other ones it's a bit hard to tell in the 2d the sensitivity is too high for um the differentiating fish but um this sort of shows why you run down scan and 2d at the same time so you can get a bit of a lie detector on on size of fish so once fish group under your boat like that instead of being single arches and separate fish um they just all sort of they glue together they run as a solid line and a straight line because they're basically doing nothing under your boat and if you look at that bottom left hand side you've got your down scan and by using that you can you can tell the size of those fish and even by looking at those fish you can sort of tell how inactive they are a few of those are even straight lining which is not very common on on your down scan so um and the fact that they've sort of lifted there, you know, there's a separation between them and the bottom, but yet they're still flat. So these fish have definitely just come up under the transducer from sitting still. But the biggest thing is to run, I like to run down scan and 2D together at the same time. And at the moment with my, I'm running a seven. So I only run a two split of, uh, I'll search with the side scan only. And then when I get on top of those fish, I just run a two-way split of 2D and down scan just so I can really understand what those fish are doing or how they're positioned and then size of those fish. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Is that the same thing as we've seen previously? Basically the same thing, yeah. Just gives yeah. you a bit more, bit more an idea, a bit more about separation of those fish. And you can tell tell the size. So a good a good bass is grain of rice, basically is rule of thumb. Yep. But as active as those fish looked on the two D, you can tell by the um, the down scan. There's there's hardly anyone home, you know. Like that, the two D looks like a full screen, and you go to the down scan, and there's what fifteen fish there, mm. and there's only five or six worth catching. Yep. Yep. All right, let me just bring up another question that we've had come on the screen. So this is from Steve Sikowski. Sikowski, how long would you sit on a school of bass if you're not catching them during a comp, or would you wait and try and work them out? Uh, short answer, I wouldn't sit there. If, um, if I can't catch them, I'll leave them. I'll go and find other active ones. And there's not many tournaments that I've fished, especially those deep sort of fish. Um, that I haven't pre-fished, so I, I would already know how to catch them and without some sort of sounding um, arrogant or whatever, I can nearly look at the fish on the sounder and understand what lure I should be throwing and from pre-fishing, say, two weeks ago or whatever, I would know what's working. So, so places like Somerset, for example, I'll have eight to ten spots, if not more, and if I can't get a bite of those fish straight away, I'll leave them, go find some other ones and just jump around between them. And in fairness, Dean, rumour has it that you're on a first-name basis with a lot of the fish in a number of storages, so you kind, of, you kind of know what they're doing and they're thinking. Yeah, a few of them know my middle name, unfortunately, too. <laughs> All right. What's the screenshot telling us, Dean? So a similar thing before, you can sort of tell. Um, I use 2D to tell the activity of the fish, and they're, they're sort of not too bad. At the start of that drop-off, they're... Um, they're looking like they're starting to arc up, but at the bottom of it, they're sort of flatlining. Um, you could sort of say that if you drove off that ledge that they would have lifted up because of the boat and then you sit there thinking that they're going to come up and they just don't. Hmm. 
they don't really do much. They just stay under the boat. But if there's not much separation in the lines, I don't get too excited and there's not much curve in them. Like a lot of guys talk about flat lining and that's basically what you're looking at. So the fish at the start on the left on that ledge are probably in their feeding position. Like I was saying, I, like, I don't like to drag them out of that. Um, and then if you go and sit on the deep side of them, you sort of drag them to you and they hang out under you and they sort of left where they were feeding. Okay. So question coming up from Charles West. Uh, do you use the fish reveal function on your sounder, Dean? I was, I was using it for a fair bit and I did like it, but then I went back to um, sort of my old way of thinking, like I said before. I like to use the down scan as my lie detector and by running fish reveal, you're seeing very similar imagery over the top of your down scan that you're seeing in your 2D, which means you, you lose that other interpretation, you know. So if I run that split and the down scan has fish reveal on it, I can't really see what I'm looking for in that in that down scan. That down scan, I'm looking for the size of that fish, separation of those fish, and um, sort of just a bit more clarity from it in like particular exactly where they're sitting, whether it might be on a little bit of rocks or whatever, whereas fish reveal is really good for highlighting fish, especially in weed and stuff like that, but then I don't get to see that difference that I'm looking for in the actual size. Very good. Justin is after some advice on what maps you're using, mate. I just run the CMAP chart, so download them straight from CMAP Genesis and, and use them. Um, lately with the live, I haven't even been putting the charts on there because the CMAP chart that comes in the in the unit has a pretty good baseline on the lake, shows riverbeds, shows the outline of the lake. So, yeah, all CMAP Genesis um, basically gives away all your secret spots these days, especially in the in the Queensland dams. Yeah, okay. Let's move on to the next screenshot. So tell us all about this one. So this is sort of, um, even though there's not a great deal of fish there, you can see it on that ledge, similar to that last one, that's where the active fish are is on that ledge. So as you come across, they're all there. And I would sort of sit away from that ledge and try and bring my lure down it. Uh, if these fish weren't going to follow the boat. But if they started to come across and follow the boat, then I'd go back up on the top side of that ledge and fish back the other way. But these fish are pretty much really active. They're bunched up. They're running around together. Sensitivity's turned down a little bit, so you got you can't really see too much about what they're eating. Um, but definitely active, good fish. And like I said, I like to see them on those ledges like that, especially Queensland dams, um, really easy to target when they're sitting on a ledge like that. Yeah, and bass, mate, I mean, I'm, I'm not a huge bass fisher, but bass do tend to be fairly competitive, don't, so, don't they? So when they're in those small groups and you can see that there's, there's fish moving up and down in the water column, it's usually a pretty good indication that that's a pretty good place to land your lure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, ledges, like you already know that they're sitting there to do that, so... When you drive over it, you just see dot, 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 dot down that ledge. That's it's game on. Yeah, yeah. So Scott says he's just bought a HGS-12. Congratulations, mate. He's never had a sounder before. How did he learn to trust it? How did he learn to trust it? Well, I guess you just need to um, catch some fish, probably the easiest way. Um, trusting it, especially with bass, is a really hard thing because you can, even barramundi, you can see fish a lot and not be able to catch them. So it's hard, but... As far as bass go and trusting your sounder, um, like I said, basically in the, in the start of this, use it to, to find the fish and determine whether they're active or not. And then don't just, you can, if you haven't targeted bass before, you can probably sit on them for a while and run through a few different lures. But if you can't get a bite, just leave those ones alone and um, go look for some different ones. But key areas to look for active ones is normally a differentiation in the bottom, like a ledge, a bit of rock, a bit of a drop off, somewhere like that. They like to normally feed on areas like that rather than just the middle of a big open flat so you find them. And of course, the other way, Scott, is go to go to YouTube, check out some of Dean's videos there, go to the little rants page, check out some of the videos there. There's some good Facebook groups around as well that will help you to understand your sounder and to interpret the, the screen as well. So 
lots of resources out there. And of course, there's these live streams as well that uh, Dean's helping us out with today. So Dean, this one's not a sonar question, but a good question nonetheless. And Matt's then apologizing for asking so many questions. Matt, we, we love questions. That's yep. what we're here for. So yep. Matt's asking, what's a good kilogram rating for a swim bait rod for cod? Well, I don't really run by the kilogram ratings, to be honest. I sort of look more at the lure you're going to throw, which is most of my fishing. Um, I find a lot of people do it the wrong way. They ask me what break and strain rod for bass. It's more about what lure I want to throw. I choose the lure, then I choose the rod. So it's the same with cod fishing. I have uh, I have about six swim bait rods now. I'm just looking at them, sorry. I have about six swim bait rods now, but only two ranges. One is from up to eight ounces. So for the big stuff like giganterels and mag drafts and those sorts of things, then the um, the other one's good for four ounces, which is your smaller, like Molly Shads, Ganterels, um, some of your lighter top water, those sorts of things. So it's more choose the choose the lure you want to throw, and then be comfortable with that. That that rod can throw it, and it will do your back amazing favors by having that <laughs> rod, especially the cod. Yeah, yeah. Steve Peach, welcome along, Steve. So Steve's asking if it's possible to distinguish or guess at what bait the bass might be feeding on based on what you're seeing on your sonar screen. Well, yes and no, but it's sort of hard not um, – I guess you can lie about that, I'd say, because you're if you're in a Queensland dam, it's bony broom, so you already know that's what they're eating. And if you're in a New South Wales dam, um, it's always galaxies and glassies and those sorts of stuff. Um, a lot smaller bait fish so and you'll see them looking a lot different in in the two dams too some will, in new south wales dams they just look like sort of towers just like a bit of cloud on your screen a bit of red and then um the bony rim sort of show up basically like tiny bass and you'll see little spanglies in there as well on the bottom um so they look very much like a fish just smaller mm. So Matt's just clarified, he says mainly he's using his swim bait rods for gandrels. I'd get the Dobbin 796, I think it is, or the Amped uh, 781XH. And Matt, you should already know because you would have watched my videos. <laughs> All right, cool, Meg Bradfield. Where to bass go in dirty water after it's rain? And can the sound help in this situation? Yes, the sound can help your frustration. Um, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we're after, mate. Blackfish Somerset, after a massive amount of rain, the lake came up huge amounts, and um, it was chocolate mud. You could find bass, they're all in random spots, they weren't where they normally are because the depth change was so much. It's not so much the dirty water, it was more about that they'd lost fish, fish get comfortable in a certain depth and that's all dependent on temperature and light so the clearer the water the deeper they'll be at a certain time of year and the dirtier the water the shallower they'll be so when a dam rises and gets muddy they typically go a lot shallower because they need the light penetration that they had before but they also stick tighter to structure because they can't they struggle to see as well so they need to have a point of reference with where they are um, but back to somerset we found tons and tons of bass that we could not get to bite on anything. And uh, a buddy of mine bought some live shrimp because he thought they're not bass and put a live shrimp down there and caught a bass in a... <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely frustrating ch trying to find them in dirty water. Um, yeah, Santa can help you locate them, but they're normally difficult to catch, especially if it's just just gotten dirty and just changed. I know at Cania Dam, the fish will basically run away from that dirty water and will still feed while they're in the clean. And then uh, once the dirty gets to them, they'll take a while before they get back to normal. And then then they'll bite again, but it's just that's, it's that transition now. They've just lost and had to move house to somewhere else. Everything's changed for them. The bait's changed as well. The bait's moved. Excellent. All right, we've got one more screen uh, shot to show you, but before we do that, a couple more questions from Mark Williams. So uh, uh, Dean, have you ever fished Lake Mondi? Do you mean, if you mean Mondurin, yes. Um, I've targeted Bay Money there a long, long time ago, and then I just went back the, the end of this barra season, actually. So um, it's a great dam, and it's a massive dam. 
at a sort of fan it as, a, as an interesting place to look for fish because you could actually use your side scan on your sounder to go look for them like drive around find the trees and spindly trees that they hang out in and then just got to work out what time they bite mm -hmm. So a question from Jaden: How do you catch so many fish in Kellogg Dam? Uh, such a hard spot to get a bite from the barra. You just have to learn to love Kellogg. That's the only <laughs> thing. Everyone says it's, there's big fish in there, but they hate the place. I love Kellogg Dam. It's amazing. It's um, but yeah, as far as if you're a barramundi fishing, you need to forget nearly everything you know about barramundi before you go to Kellogg. It's uh, there's no weed, a lot of rock, a lot of timber. Um, I'm about to put up another video, which I still haven't had time to edit from when uh, Takuma was here, but I caught 13 to 15 barra a morning on jerk baits in the trees, and it was amazing. We, I found some fish in some shallower trees uh, one afternoon. We caught a couple and a bit hard to find. Well, not a bit hard to find, a bit hard to catch. There wasn't as many there as I'd like. Went out the next morning, it was dark, and I just decided to idle around and look nearby where those fish were and as, as i was driving off and on the riverbed ledge every time i come across the trees that were hugging that riverbed line they're in 35 feet of water i thought there's barra sitting on the tops of those trees and i just ignored it and next time i come over it was again so i waypointed it next time i went over it was again and i'm like there's about 300 meters of barramundi sitting in the tops of these trees <laughs> and I'm like, yeah for the next two to three days i proceeded to catch them on jerk baits and ridiculous fun so, what, what time of year was that, Dean, out of curiosity? Uh, that would have been February, I think. Yeah. So typically, um, the same with bass, like the, when spring and, and the, the deep or the deep water bass and stuff anyway, um, a lot of the fish are shallow. They like that that warming water as it starts mm. to warm up. Um, about Monday do anyway. And then when it gets towards the end of the season, after the heat of summer and the end of summer, they'll – They'll be shallow for a little bit, maybe, and then push deeper, especially in Calide. So, night time you might still catch them shallow, but um, later in the day they just push out and they hang out in those in the tops of those trees, all suspended, and they're not really in a feeding mood. That's why I use a jerk bait, and you really had to smack that tree with the jerk bait. I tried to be sneaky and just go to the left or the right once I found it, but you had to smack that tree. In one particular morning, I lost seven jerk baits. <laughs> Sounds like there's a, a podcast interview in the making there too, mate. So uh, we might have to put a bit of pressure on you to come on board and, and talk about Calhoun Barra. Oh, mate, yeah. it's, it's a great fishery. Now, Mark's asked the question, mate, compare for us largemouth bass and Australian bass. Which one would you rather target and why? Two very different fish. Oh, completely different. But definitely largemouth bass because it means I'm in America. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but the thing is with largemouth bass, like you sort of get to the thing where you say that they don't really fight, but that's not a fair judgment on that fish because you're targeting largemouth bass with barramundi and cod tackle, like 50 pound braid, 20 pound straight through fluorocarbon, um, seven, eight foot rods that are, their line class is different to ours as far as the rating of the rod, but they're barramundi sticks and, and, um, cod sticks, you know, like I could easily bring on my flipping sticks home and chuck big swim baits on them. So it's not really, they're awesome fish to catch. I just love how you can go to a lake and it'd be, you put 200 guys on it and they'll find 50 different ways to catch that fish. Whereas in Oz, you do a tournament in Oz, like Lake Sinclair, for example, every single person in winter is throwing a two inch easy shiner to them. <laughs> Whereas largemouth bass, whatever you want to do, you can do it. And as I said before, I'm, I like to target active fish. I don't like to mess around with fish that are difficult to catch. So largemouth bass for me is definitely better because there is always a way to find active fish and on a technique that you like yourself. Cool. All right, let's go back to Aussie bass. So, Dean, what's your opinion on fluoro versus nylon leaders for bass? Seeing a lot of people going back to nylon for its suppleness. Yeah, I don't know about... Um, people going back to nylon unless they're fishing it straight through. But I, um, I definitely run fluorocarbon. I run the Sunline Invisible, and um, I love it for its sensitivity and its strength. Like I can fish down south with six pound in amongst all the trees and basically lock it up and pull those fish out. And 
uh, even with those deep bass, I run 5 pound with no drag, but I'll double my leader length because a straight line pull of of 14 foot of 5 pound, no bass is going to break that, not a New South Wales bass. All right. Questions are coming in thick and fast, mate. They're not all sonar questions, but that's all right. So winter at Somerset, deep schools or chase the edges? Thanks, Trent, for that question. Well, winter in Somerset is always a hard one because they've got that change in temperature. Um, you sort of have to wait until sort of like you'll catch them up until April, maybe in May in a certain area. And then you've got that transition where the thermocline disappears and the fish go from, say, sitting in 30 or 40 to moving back into sort of 20 to 25. And it's that transition that really makes it hard to find fish and that's normally when people go to the edges and those fish that they're targeting on the edge they're always on the edge they're not they're not schooling fish that we target they're just they're just randoms that live there not every like humans you know not everyone is the same there's the people that like to do a little bit a little bit left of center and there's the bass in someone said on the edges are definitely those ones so i'll always target them deep but you do have maybe four to six weeks when that transition where it's really hard to find where they are. They could just be basically glued on the bottom or they could be out in 50 or 60 on the bottom in places you just don't look, but they definitely disappear out of normal places anyway for a while. So Paul Langley's asking, uh, are the big cod in Glenbourne worth targeting or are they just too few in numbers and it's just a lucky bycatch? Well, I'd like to say they are worth targeting. I, I had planned on doing it um, this season, which I haven't been able to, but I'm only new to impoundment cod. So even just at Barrenjuk this week, I learned so much um, about deep water cod anyway. I mean, all, all fisheries, a bit like bass, are completely different. The food in here is obviously different to other places I've fished, but um, I did catch a massive cod in Glenbourne on a beetle spin on a four pound line, believe it or not. Um, and I know a few other people that have caught them by accident, but I've had friends fishing there in winter and seeing the cod um, sunning themselves. So I reckon I've heard of eight to ten cod hooked by accident and uh, I know when Aberdeen put up his post about it, there's a few people talking on there saying that they've had this cod fishery to themselves and now it's ruined. So um, <laughs> I would say yes, it's worth worth <laughs> it a crack anyway. And it doesn't hurt. You know we're fishing for cod outside of bass hours. I mean, Glenbourne in winter – catch bass all day so i would go target bass i mean target cod for two hours in the morning fish for bass and then go back out and target cod for three or four hours in the evening slash night but i think it's always a fair bet if you hear of uh, you know, hear stories of fish being caught accidentally as a bycatch that there's yeah. probably a case there to target them so definitely all right so ej black is asking dean what's your favorite dam in Mackay, and what's the best way to catch better there Ooh, yeah, we got, how long have we got? This, this could be a long, a long answer coming up here. I like talking about it, bro. I can't wait to <laughs> um, In Mackay, it has to be Timbra. And, um, yeah, the best way to target them is just sitting off those points. Just takes you a little while to work out which points they're on. Um, sitting off those points and just slow rolling that Molly Shad 140. Um, you can go around the edges in that place with – I don't know about top water anymore. I haven't done it for a long time, but you can go around and pick up residents with um, with jerk baits. But I definitely like to, to find where they're moving into and fish those almanac times and um, wait for them to roll in, catch them, and then go back and hang out somewhere cooler. All right, let's go back to bass and let's go back to sonar. So, would you only sound for schooled up bass in open water, or is backside structure a viable option in impoundments? What's I don't know what it means by backside structure. But, yeah, I would – I use um, the sounder, obviously, to look for schooled up bass in in open water, and I still use it in New South Wales dams where they don't – they sort of school up, but I'm not targeting those schooled fish, but I definitely use it to locate fish in an area. So fishing weed beds, points, um, even the backs of some bays, fish will show up that are sitting out in that anywhere from 12 to 20 feet. And in, I'm not targeting those fish at all, but I like to know that they're there because the active ones will be up in that weed or around timber or so on 
feeding. Even in Glenbourne, um, you can go to those deep timberline bays and you'll see a whole heap of fish suspended out in, even out in 50 foot on some of those deeper banks in amongst that timber and really, really hard to catch, but you will catch them like on that bank. So, yeah, bank side. So, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely use it to know, gives you comfort in knowing that you can see there's a whole heap of fish in this area because bass, bass aren't really like to be lonely. Um, if you see them on the sounder in New South Wales dams anyway, sitting out of that structure, out of that weed, you know there's going to be active ones up in amongst it. All right. One more question, mate, then we might have a look at that last screenshot. So, Dean, joining a Gen 3 to Elite TI2. You can't, raise, you no? can't network um, Elite TI2s. They can only talk to each other and it's, uh, through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, I think. But it only shares 2D as well. It doesn't share down scan. All right. So we've got a couple more questions come through, Dean, but we might just shuff over to the screenshot anyway and we'll come back to those questions. So... Robbie and Warren, I've seen your questions there, but we'll come back to them in a moment. So, Dean, the last of our screenshots, give us a bit of a walkthrough of what's happening here, mate. So basically exactly what I said with one of those other ones before, you've got a whole heap of fish on the bottom that are completely disinterested in anything, um, and you have those active fish up at 10 feet. So if you're not paying attention to what's going on in the sound, uh, and you fish a spoon or a plastic even and you cast it out, you let it hit the bottom and you slow roll it back, you're not even going to be anywhere near those fish. So with those active ones and definitely bigger fish sitting at 10, um, you can target them a few different ways, I guess. You could, I could guess you could sort of hop lures pretty high to, um, to reach them or all I'd really be doing is counting down my lure and trying to target them. And typically with a... I might count it down to get that lure to about 15 and then a bit of a faster retrieve that gets it up to about eight or nine and then open the bow to get it back down to 15 and just keep repeating that to um, zigzag, so to speak, through those active fish. So, Dean, one of the things that I found with most species of fish, and I'm curious about whether your experience is the same with bass, is that generally speaking, fish will quite readily rise up to a lure or they'll take a lure that's at the same depth they are, but much less common for a fish to dive down to learn. In that case, you were showing fish that were below the school that were inactive anyway, and the fish at the top were active. But I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Well, I don't want to argue. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. I'd love I to be corrected. Different things are. So what I've found with fish, fish that are difficult to catch or fish that like to, as you say, follow your lure, track your lure, um, I have sort of two principles of those fish where I don't like to let them get a good look at the lure. So you either do that by speed, which means they can never actually catch up to it unless they unless they chase it to bite it. And normally by chasing it, it gets them excited, which makes them commit. Or similar, if you have fish sitting close to the bottom um, that are inactive, I'll basically drag the lure along under them and it's close enough that they can see it, but they can't actually get a fix on it because their eyes are on top of their head hmm. and there's a bit of a difference. So to be able to look at that thing or to see what it is, they don't have hands like us, so they sort of got to turn over and they'll have to hit it because it's annoying them that it's there and typically you'll be going a lot slower with that retrieve too, so it's, it's there for a long period of time. But you're not giving them a look at that lure. If you slow roll that lure and you cleared the bottom, it would be up at their eyesight, maybe above, and they could look at it and then they could ignore it. No, we don't want it. But this thing that's just creeping through the mud below them, they can't really see what's going on. They know it's there and it's it's like you get you you're getting their curiosity. Mm -hmm. So I like to try yeah. and take either take lures away from them as much as I can or force a fish to bite it so that they can have a look at what it is. Yeah, and of course, fish don't have to see a lure to be able to find it. You know, the, the lateral line and the sense of hearing is phenomenal. Uh, and, and so, you know, a lure that's grubbing around anywhere near them, they're going to know it's there. I've All right. Vertically. Question. Sorry, Dean. Uh, I fish vertically in Glenbourne for bass where you're basically game boying a fish. And you can be in 100 feet of water, there'll be a bass at 80, and you're using a three inch jigging grub, which is a little curl tail plastic on a, on a mm. one. Head so it sinks really, really slow. 
a fish will be at 80 feet. This thing comes down, it gets to 20. That fish is already starting to come up. You yep. can't tell me he saw that thing. He felt no. it. No, so, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very in tune with this around. Fish, the, the, if you look at how a fish's eye works, it's not like a human eye. They can't actually focus the same way that we do. They're, the whole lens on a fish's eye has to move. That's <laughs> it. The whole lens has to move in. Our, our, our eyes, muscles adjust the, the lens to, to allow us to see distance. So fish can't see or focus on things very far away. If you're talking about a small object a long way above them, no way they've seen it. No. So it has to be it has to be lateral line that they, they're picking it up with or sound. I've heard of... Uh... Miller was telling me he runs a squidgy wriggler for his brim when he's fishing deep for the exact same reason. He said they will hear that wriggler yep. come all the way down, move across. By the time it hits the bottom, they can just pick it up. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on. So Robbie's asking if you're headed back to the US for a full season next year. I'm guessing that depends on one or two things. Yeah. So um, the plan was, yes. Yeah, so this year was just to do a couple of tournaments and um, – build all my social media and everything up so that I could ask for more money off certain companies when I get over there. But, um, yeah, with all the COVID-19 stuff and how Australia's been and America's been even worse, uh, even if tournaments do go back to full swing next year, I'm not sure that we'll even be really allowed to go over there. So it's sort of – at this stage, I'd say no. Um, I'll definitely be getting to the first tournament that I'm physically allowed to get to. Just because I love it so much over there, but um, I don't think I'll be able to commit to a full one, unfortunately. Yeah, right. So uh, where are we? So another question from Warren. So, what's your favourite, a Wonga Barra or Calide, and why? Yeah, <laughs> any barra, any barra is a good barra. Oh, it has to be Calide. A Wonga is getting really, really good. Like. Um, I'll be very, very surprised if I don't catch a couple of metres a session in a Wonga this year. So the only thing Calide has had better than a Wonga in the past sort of two years that I've been back on Barra is um, the size, the size of the fish that's in there. Whereas a Wonga went from sort of 60s to 70s to 80s and then well, last time I was there was mid to high 90s. So I'm, I'm expecting a few good metres there in this season for sure. Excellent. So Rodney's saying, uh, have you targeted schooling bass in Lenfels Dam? Nope. We went there to look for schooling bass and the dam had just come up 15 feet and uh, basically everything had disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> we spent two days there standing around and didn't see a single thing, so we left and went to Mondrian. Uh, it can be a tough dam. That Lenfels great when it fires, but tough when it's not. Okay, on bass, what's your favourite go-to lure? Spoon, plastics, or crankbaits? Well, that's yeah. So many variables in that question. Um, so hens, for example, uh, I'm normally a spoon man, and I had to go to plastics. Plastics was catching them hand over fist compared to to um, spoons. Somerset is nearly always a spoon bite, but then you do get times in Somerset where a crank will just wreck them better than anything else. And I think it comes back to what I was saying before about not letting the fish actually look at that lure. So the crank has to hit the bottom and it has to be sort of shoving everything and everyone out of its way and they'll choke it. Whereas metals don't really have that ability of creating that ruckus down there. But yeah, my go-to is definitely a spoon all the way. Got a feeling this might be someone you know, mate. <laughs> One of the best tips for stealing your mate's GT. <laughs> This way, wait, wait till Kenny stirs it up on a popper and then go and chuck a swim bait in there. <laughs> All right. We've got one from Kelvin. I'm just going to, when I can get it to come up on the screen, it's uh, it's a fairly long one and I'm not able to scroll on it for some reason. So just bear oh, with me a sec. Here we go. So Kelvin's asking, in, in Victorian impoundments in winter, the water temperature becomes really cold and the bass become really hard to find. They don't seem to school in the size that you're showing on your screenshots. What depths would you look for them? And also for bass sitting on the bottom in small schools on hard ground, what's the best way to set up side scan to separate bottom and small schools? Thanks for that question, Kelvin. I would say um, that because it's really cold, the fish have gone shallow. So Victorian bass seem to set up a lot like New South Wales bass, which like I was saying with Blue Rock versus Glenbourne, it was so similar. Um, 
they're probably not schooled up at all in in winter. They should be super super shallow. Um, you should be able to target them on on soft plastics, probably like a two inch easy shiner, or um, like I did in late April, target them with a, with a jackal chara blade, get that chatterbait bite happening. Um, as far as differentiating on the side scan, I don't change any of my settings. It's all it's all on auto. Just pick a color palette that that you like. I prefer the blue and the white, um, which I think is nine from memory. Um, and you should be able to clearly identify them. And with side scan too, it's if you're looking at that definitive separation like that, you really need to be sort of idling along so that your side scan is, is laying that data fresh the whole way and that's the best way to get your clearest image and separation and then you can you can come back and target the fish after that. Doesn't work so well at anchor the old side scan. Not really, it just overlays too much information and the scroll speed doesn't take it away clear enough for you. Yeah, yeah. So this is the last of the questions that are on my screen, Dean. Um, if you've got any more questions, folks, before we wrap it up, we've been going for an hour now, so it probably is time to start drawing things to a close, but we might be able to squeeze one or two more questions in. But Jaden's asking how you find feeding barra on your sounder. Are they sitting suspended or moving through? And he's talking again about calide no longer. So. Um, feeding barra. So in calide, um, it's pretty easy to, to – well, both teams are pretty easy to identify feeding barra because you'll be sitting in a location where you know that they move through and they just turn up. It's like clockwork. So the almanac will tell you whether it's whether it's tiber related, moon related, but the fish are going to feed from 11 to 1. You get to an area at 10.30, there'll be no one home, and then they just start, they just start rolling through. Um, typically, even, even a longer as well, um, calide, if I'm targeting them in timber, they're not feeding fish. If they're sitting in those trees, that's where they hang out. That's home. And the best way to target them is with a jerk bait, just because it it sits in their face, it annoys them, that erratic action really upsets them. And especially if there's a whole bunch of them in there, because like we said with the bass, it's, it starts to become competitive. Then one might go have a look at it, and then another one wants to have a look, and before you know it, one of them just has to grab it because it's it's either him, him or me. One of them has to get it. Yeah, yeah. Very good, mate. That's it. We've got no more questions come up. So I want to thank you for coming along uh, on a, at the end of a long day on the water. You know, uh, I think you had probably the fastest shower on record. You, uh, we, we hooked up, made sure everything was working, tested it all out, and Dean's gone, right, I'm off for a shower. So good on you, mate. It's been, uh, it's been tremendous. You've shared some great information. Thanks to everyone who came along and asked some great questions. It's always good to have plenty of interaction in these live streams. We really appreciate that. And and of course, thanks also to Navico and Lawrence for getting behind these and, and helping us to put them on. It's, uh, it's tremendous to have their backing and their support. So, Dean, with that, mate, I'm going to let you go off, have a feed, maybe a beer, get a bit of sleep and go out and do it all again tomorrow. No, oh, definitely a bit of a sleep. I've, um, it's been a long week, not a long day. Chasing cod is definitely uh, not for the weak-hearted. <laughs> <laughs> it can be hard work. Thank you long for hours casting big lures. Thank you for your time. It's much appreciated. And I hope um, some of this information helps people catch some more bass. Yeah, no doubt it will. Thanks again, Dean. Thanks again, everybody. Good night. And we'll talk to you next Monday when we do another masterclass. So bye for now.